Having fully reviewed the Intel Pentium G4560 CPU, including follow-up coverage on best GPU pairings with the G4560, we decided to assemble a gaming PC around the budget Intel chip. This follows our previous PC build, which featured an R5-1600X for mid-range cost. Today's takes a less metered approach. We're staying below $500, closer to $450 to $480, and leveraging only hardware in our lab to do it. Before getting to that, this video is brought to you by iFixit.com and the PC Essentials Toolkit, which can be had for $20, making it one of their cheapest yet most complete toolkits. Use code GAMERSNEXUS for $5 off to bring that to 15. You can go to iFixit.com slash GAMERSNEXUS or click the link below for more information. As usual with our PC builds, one of my requirements for our team, Eric and Patrick worked on this, was to use only parts that we had here. So no ordering stuff. And we have a couple suggestions in this content where we would make changes were we to order something. That way you can benefit from those changes. But this gives us a solid baseline to work from. Do some FPS tests, power draw tests to show that no, you do not even need a 500 watt PSU, but the price was good on Newegg anyway. So we can establish all of that with what we have here. We've done thermals, noise, power, and FPS, of course, and that tells us exactly how all the parts are performing, where we can improve them if you were to build your own. And the goal of the build was to assemble a cheap gaming machine using Intel's new Pentium part, which seems to somewhat invalidate almost the i3 territory chips. Now, there are some key differences in AVX support and things like that, but as far as gaming goes, a G4560 does pretty damn well and is right in the territory where the i3s previously have been. So that makes it a good candidate for a cheap gaming PC until we see something from AMD's Ryzen line in this price category. It's a little ways out still. And we've also paired for now a GTX 1050 with a build. A few things here. We looked at 1050 Ti's, they're appealing. There were a couple that were $120, but the sales were still hit and miss. Sometimes it'd be 120, sometimes it would be 140. At 140, the price was just a little too high and entering into 570 territory or exiting 560 territory where it didn't make a whole lot of sense. But the 1050 is consistently 80 to $100 depending on sales. And that was a good pairing. So we'll go through all those numbers and some of the other options from the 1050 Ti and the 570. You can see all that in our when does the G4560 CPU bottleneck benchmark. That contains all those numbers. If you're curious how much more you can get out of the performance with a better GPU. Overall, not counting rebates, we're looking at a price of roughly $470, though if you count the rebates, it falls closer to $450, but we all know how reliable those are. This build uses a Gigabyte B250 HD3 motherboard, which is one of the immediate things that you could cut down to lower the cost, something we'll talk about more later. It's also got the MSI 1050OC card at 100 or 80 after rebate if you count those. And then we're using HyperX Fury 2400 MHz memory at 8 gigabytes for $68. EVJ's 500 watt power supply is also routinely on sale for 20 to 30 bucks, enough to be reliable. That was technically about $50 MSRP. The Corsair Spec 04 enclosure is what we're using for the case as it's the lowest cost case we have right now. We just reviewed it so we know exactly what its strengths and weaknesses are. And it still retains some level of quality in the $50 class. The drive is a simple one terabyte WD Blue 7200 RPM disc. And if you had money, you could spring for an SSD, but for something ultra budget, this makes sense. And so again, we set the bar with our PC builds by doing actual benchmarks of thermals, power, noise, and gaming, rather than just assembling a list on Newegg or whatever and calling it a day. That is why we require the parts here. These are all things we've worked with and that to some level we either trust a good amount or we trust with caveats that we've explained in all the reviews so that you know what to look out for. That's why we use these parts because we know them and can recommend them as a complete unit that's been fully tested here. So let's start with the FPS benchmarks to keep things easy and then we'll roll into power temperatures and noise. The goal for gaming performance in such an inexpensive PC was roughly 60 FPS at medium to high settings. Starting at the low end of the spectrum, Sniper Elite 4 on high, which is somewhat ambitious, ran at only 44.7 FPS average despite excellent optimization on behalf of the game. However, this is a game that relies somewhat heavily on the GPU, and as demonstrated in our G4560 bottlenecking article, there is a somewhat significant performance uplift by using a 1050 Ti 
we can actually show that benchmark briefly here to show where the other GPUs land. With this PC build, there was no stuttering though, and medium settings raised the average near enough to our 60 FPS goal that we could call it good. That said, Sniper tends to perform better on cost-to-cost -cost AMD hardware, given its optimization focus for AMD hardware right now. So if this is the only game you want to play, or maybe Doom is included in that, it'd be worth considering an RX 560 instead. The more demanding Ghost Recon at Wildlands, however, still at the low end of the spectrum, remain just below 50 FPS average at medium settings, while GTA 5, tested with a mix of very high-end ultra graphics, had a higher average with comparable lows. GTA's performance is impressive here, and dropping a few settings from ultra to high would permit frame rates north of 60 FPS average pretty consistently. And just keep in mind that the type of hardware we're running on is pretty cheap, considering that this is what's capable of 60 FPS now with pretty damn high graphic settings in GTA, that's not anything to be ashamed of. Total War fared better, again nearly at a 60 FPS average but with less drastic dips. This is with high settings, so you could drop to medium and be in pretty good shape if you're not happy with this. And then Overwatch at the maximum possible settings performed roughly the same, but consistently high frame rates are much more important in competitive gaming. For that reason, we followed our own Overwatch graphics optimization guide, raised the average FPS to 87 from following that guide, and increased the 0.1% lows to a more manageable 51. This shows us that dropping settings a bit will permit frame rates greater than 60 FPS, though Overwatch and other esports type titles hold on well with the higher quality settings, and with Overwatch anyway, you can lower things that you'll never really notice anyway, even though the FPS impact is noticeable. For power testing, as measured at the wall, we're measuring an idle total system power consumption at around 30 watts, with multi-threaded blender rendering at 54 watts, GPU blender rendering at 82 watts total system draw, so that gives us a look at CPU and GPU total utilization. And then Overwatch Gaming was around 115 watts draw. You could easily drop down to a 420 to 450 watt power supply for this build and still have some power budget overhead. But it's tough to find good PSUs in the 400 watt range that aren't complete garbage or aren't overpriced for the wattage. They exist but the value tends to be better at this 500 watt market. Borrowing some of our brand new case testing methodology that made its debut on the Spec 04, a 3D Mark stress test burn-in puts a realistic gaming load level on the CPU and GPU jointly rather than using our normal torture testing. This establishes a CPU load temperature of 24.8 Celsius delta T over ambient and a GPU load temperature of 44.6 Celsius delta T over ambient. This means that considering ambient temperature, our GPU is nearing the 70 Celsius point. We're completely fine on both components, despite running a stock CPU cooler and a low-end video card cooler. Neither the CPU nor the GPU produce much heat here, and adding an $8 case fan would be beneficial to keeping the CPU and GPU cooler speeds lower, which would help in noise reduction. Speaking of noise, for noise testing, our tests were performed with the single case fan at max speed, and we left the GPU fan to adjust itself automatically, unless otherwise noted. We knew that Intel's stock CPU cooler would be loud and somewhat inconsistent in its speeds, and past tests with MSI's 1050 and 1050Ti OC models have shown them to be prone to buzzing at higher fan RPMs, so we weren't expecting much here. That said, at idle, the system reaches a noticeable but surprisingly tolerable 38 dBA. It's not silent by any means, and any activity at all causes the CPU fan to audibly ramp up, but headphone users shouldn't have any problems. Just for reference, the noise floor here is about 26 dBA. The chosen components require very little cooling and noise levels could easily be reduced by purchasing a real CPU cooler with a larger fan, but Intel's stock heatsink is completely adequate and free. Loading the CPU with Blender and the GPU with a 3 d Mark stress test in two additional tests barely affected the noise levels, as the G4560's low temperatures combined with Gigabyte's default CPU fan curve kept the fan from rising too much in RPM, Manually tuning fan speed to 100% revealed just how bad things can get if they were to get bad, and that was 44.9 dBA. It sounds more like a vacuum cleaner than a PC at that point, but you could still tolerate it with headphones and if you are particularly ignorant to noise because you'd rather not spend a whole bunch of money to reduce it. Again, the reason we feel comfortable keeping a noisier cooler installed is because the 4560 will rarely reach temperatures that require those higher fan speeds, Though again, the extra fan would help reduce cooler RPM modulation. So we're pretty happy with the performance overall. Again, off the shelf parts from here, it's performing pretty well. You could drive down cost a little bit more. So there's an easy $20 savings in the motherboard. We have an HD3 in here, it's a B250 board, ATX, it's a gigabyte board. 
that runs close to $90, which for a G4560 isn't really necessary. Now it does give you some upgrade headroom if you wanted to pull that chip later and put something better in there. But because it's not a Z SKU, you're not really gonna get the full potential out of a real upgrade to a K SKU anyway, because you're gonna be locked for overclocking. So there's, it's a point of diminishing returns where you can either go full Z SKU and enable yourself for the upgrade later, or commit to what is more likely reality for most of us and just buy a cheaper board, stick with the 4560 until you're ready for a complete full system build. Uh, so the options there, maybe an ASRock B250M Pro 4, that's a micro ATX motherboard we don't have, but it's a bit cheaper. So you save about 20 bucks there if you really were desperate for the 20 bucks. This board is good. It's probably better in a few ways. But again, $20 not necessarily needed. Another option would be from Gigabyte, the B250M micro ATX version of the DS3H, uh, similar to this board, but micro ATX, another 20 bucks off. Or for cases, you could go down to something like a 200R for about 40 bucks right now as of today. Deep Cools, Tesseract, plenty of other cases, DIY PC. They're not necessarily, they're, well, not even not necessarily. They are not the highest quality cases. Neither is this to be fair, but it's a bit better than some of those. But again, you're looking at how much, how much do you want to spend to get a little bit better quality when you're already at the low end budget scale to begin with. Uh, personally, my philosophy is if spending an extra $10 will make me happier for the however long I will have the system, then I'll do it. But that's just my way of doing things, especially in the case department, because you're gonna be staring at it for the whole time you have the system. So. Uh, overall, not a bad build, performs well. You can do 60 FPS gaming on it with medium-ish settings in a lot of the more intensive games, or you can get away with high in a couple of them. Overwatch is a good example. You can basically do Ultra there, and the same is true for GTA V without advanced graphics settings. So pretty damn good overall, impressive considering where the industry was a few years ago. And as long as you're at 1080p, you're in good shape with a setup similar to this. Of course, many improvements can be made. We've given you a couple of suggestions, but uh, stay tuned, subscribe for more because there will always be more PC builds. So uh, patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly or just subscribe because we'll have tons of Computex stuff this coming week to watch. That helps us even more than other options. Thank you for watching. We'll see you all next time.